To begin, we would like to acknowledge that tonight's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work in this community. This film is eligible for the Grolsch People's Choice Award. Vote for your favorite film at tiff.net slash vote. We would like to thank Protagonist Pictures for, for providing us with this film. Thank you to the British Council for their generous support. Janya Button was born in London. Her directorial credits include the short film Fire and the feature Burn, Burn, Burn. Vita in Virginia is her latest film. Please help me in welcoming to the stage Janya Button. Hello. Hello, Toronto. Which I've never said that before. Hello. This is a podium. Lovely. Um, thank you so much. It's such a privilege to be at Toronto Film Festival. Um, I, and this theatre is absolutely magical. And you will discover at a moment in our film that it's sort of oddly apt. So I'm wondering whether... <laughs> wondering, whether wondering whether one of our amazing team has come in and dressed it for us. Um, there are so many films at this festival about people finding their voices for the first time. And uh, our film's relationship with that theme is slightly different. Uh, these are two women who have found their voices. These are two women who know exactly who they are. But this is the first moment I think this film could have ever been made. The first moment it could have found an audience. So it's us who is finding their voices for the first time. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank the programmers at Toronto for doing us the honour of inviting us here. Um, and I'd like to introduce these two fantastic, fabulous, wonderful, brilliant, intelligent, smart, amazing women who, um, uh, who chose to work with me on our film, uh, Elizabeth Debicki and Jen Rasterton. And uh, our fantastic producers, the uh, amazing Katie Holly. <laughs> and uh, Simon Baxter and Evangelo Cusis. <laughs> there are many members of our team who could sadly not be with us in Toronto. They are in far-flung places making, making other work and wish they could be here tonight. But we do have two of our heads of department here who have done incredible work. My editor, a man who is prepared to sit in a room with me for months on end, so please give him a really hearty round of applause. <laughs> he is generous and patient and kind. His name is Mark Trend. <laughs> and our stone-cold gifted composer, Isabel Woolbridge. so much. Enjoy the film. Um, yeah, that's it. We will be here for a Q&A. Please don't leave. And of course, our two stars, Gem Arterton and Elizabeth Debecki. Thank you so much for bringing your film to us in Toronto. We're so happy to be able to share it with our audiences. And uh, so to begin our question and answer period, uh, first to you, Janya. You've said that Virginia Woolf has influenced how I think about everything. Um, how is this experience to adapt her life and letters versus one of her novels outright? So why did you choose to do your film this way? Um, well, 
The reason I wanted to make the film is because it sheds light on um, a moment in Virginia Woolf's life that, that, that even I wasn't super familiar with before I had the opportunity to explore it. She's a woman who, if we can be relied on to know anything about her, it's how she died. Um, and, and somebody who has become associated with that and with that, with that profound fragility. And this film, as, as, as I hope you as I hope you think, um, captures a moment of profound strength in her life, um, where her creative genius arrived to um, save her from an experience that everyone around her thought would overwhelm her. So for me, the real excitement in, in making the film and, and exploring both her life and her work in this kind of hybrid way um, was an opportunity to explore a moment of, of, of strength and a moment where... Uh, where someone can can save themselves. Mm, absolutely. And I, I find that one of the most powerful uh, de devices or traits of this film in, in telling that story is the intimacy that uh, you explore in, in, their, in Vita and Virginia's relationship and then also what you share with the audience through your camera. So how did you arrive at the at this style of telling this story? Um. Well, they're two very unconventional women. They lived lives who, they lived very progressive lives even for, even for today. Um, their approach to marriage, their approach to their work, their approach to each other. Um, so I knew I was gonna have to make um, uh, an unconventional film. <laughs> um, and so that had a bearing on several fronts, those letter sequences, which are, um, which I, I very much enjoy, I hope. I hope. A couple of you did. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, uh, that was a, a, a real stylistic choice in, in terms of, you know, the, the Beach and Virginia's correspondence with each other was the backbone of their romance and their writers and their peacocking their craft to one another. And the, 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 the intimacy of the letters was something very challenging to bring to screen because letters are meant to be read. So finding a visual style for them that made it worth coming to the cinema to experience um, was, uh, was cool. Um, and hopefully uh, that, the, the sort of that kind of direct camera approach gives you a, a feeling of what it might be like to be seduced by Virginia Woolf or Vita Sackville West or either of these two <laughs> ladies. Um, and, and the music as well was a huge um, uh, uh, stylistic choice. Yes, for the music. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, because they lived unconventional, bold lives, the film needed to sound unconventional and bold, so that too. Mm -hmm. So unconventional and bold characters, how did you two, Gemma and Elizabeth, come to kind of build this intimate relationship that we see uh, on screen and in these confessional moments with the, the letters? Well, um, the, the letters that they wrote were ex Expensive. Yeah. Um, it's like a Bible. It's bigger than the Bible, really. Um, they were, if they were alive now, they'd be prolific WhatsAppers, <laughs> sending <laughs> massively long, you know, texts to each other. You know, those essay type ones where you're like, well, I'll leave that till later to read. Um, but there was so much in there. Well, that, that's what Vita would say. She'd be like, I'll leave that till later. Virginia would read it straight away, like, ah. <laughs> Um, but there was so much in those to base. <laughs> so true. The ticks would go blue. <laughs> yeah, Peter, Virginia would be going, "Oh my God, the blue ticks! She's read it. She's read it." And she hadn't. She'd be obsessing over the blue ticks. Um, so that was a real gift for us um, because you can read their work, and um, I think especially with um, Virginia's work, there's so it's so. You can kind of get an idea of how she kind of thought. Vita is much more evasive and um, sort of has a mask all the time. So th the letters is really where there's a lot of truth and um, honesty. And I think we kind of use those as our kind of, th as the anchor really for everything. I really recommend reading the letters. Now that you've watched the film, you've, re you've heard a lot of them, but there's more. <laughs> And so, I mean, there's so much trust in, uh, in 
telling a story like this between your actors and, and the camera, especially in these close-up moments. Um, so how did you kind of all work together in, in, uh, in creating these, these very honest and vivid moments for their romance? Uh, well, Tanya Button is a wonderful director, um, and we trusted her, basically. Um, you know, um, it was a very safe set, it was very collaborative, and I think we were very clear about what kind of story we were trying to tell. Um, and, and, I mean, bizarrely, I just had a memory of the, the scene where they kiss in front of the fireplace. <laughs> With the camera panning in. <laughs> it was a brilliant moment where we were, as the English like to say, snogging. And, and it sort of was going on for quite a while. Ages. And, um, and then, but, you know, we were having a lovely time anyway. And then, um, and then sort of Chenny went, cut. And we both looked at the camera like, at the same time. <laughs> was it all right? Was it all right? Um, I don't know. It was just this kind of like beautifully liberating free set. And we were happy when we were making the film. And we were happy that we were going to tell a story about women um, in a really empowering, empowered way. And I don't, it was a beautifully... Um, we had a nice time. We had a really nice time making it, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so I'm going to open up the, the question to the audience now. Unless you want to. Yes. Um, any questions for our directors? Yep, just down here. Yep. So I'll just repeat the question for the house. Um, so the question is if uh, Virginia Woolf, if she ever described kind of her hallucinatory or her, uh, her moments of uh, a, a breakdown a little bit in her writing and her work? Well, uh, there are a couple of moments in, in her diaries and in her letters where she talks about, um, I, I, I don't know whether we would call them hallucinations or where she talks about moments where she had sort of breaks from, breaks from reality. That um, if, if there's any Wolf fans in the house, um, you'll know that yeah, <laughs> we're such nerds. <laughs> um, uh, there's, a, there's a sort of famous moment where she says she um, sort of she's in the gardens at Charleston and hears the birds, thinks they're talking Greek. Um, and then there's another letter where she sort of hallucinates a snake coming out of the yolk of an egg. Um, so there are little fragments in the letters that suggested, I think, that sometimes her mind would take her to a, to a very odd interior, kind of surreal place. But those sequences, as with much of the film, you know, uh, these, what, what, it's really our response to their story and their life, and there's much about it. So, you know, there's this kind of lovely meta aspect to the film, I think, that, um, you know, Virginia wrote a book about Vita without ever writing a word about her. It was a, an amazingly expressionistic approach to capturing someone's essence, and we hope we've done a similar thing with our film. It's our response to their story, so there's much of it that, that, that is as much us as, as, it, was, as it was them. So those, those sequences are our take on what it might have been like to be inside a mind like hers. Mm, very nice. Okay, another question? Yes, down here. I noticed that the film was in memory of Bill Shepard. And do you speak to that? Um, Bill Shepard's um, uh, Dame Eileen Atkins, who co-wrote the script, um, is her husband, who um, sadly passed away um, uh, before we made the film. But he always very, want, very much wanted the film to come to life. So, yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes, just in the middle here. Oh, sorry. You... sorry, do you mind just speak up? It's the most, most challenging, challenging and the most rewarding. rewarding. Okay, thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, um. Uh, so the most challenging part was trying to um, play Virginia Woolf and the most rewarding part was trying to play Virginia Woolf. <laughs> um, yeah, it was really terrifying and very daunting. Um, I tried my best um, you know I mean to get inside that woman's mind was um, an overwhelming task um, and then I suppose the sort of reward 
came at a point where I um, surrendered to our vision and, and just whatever was going to come out of me as her in a funny way. Um, and then at that point it was very freeing and actually I learned a tremendous amount about being human and about um, being a woman and about love actually, playing her. So, And also meeting these two wonderful people and getting to do something together in, in a beautiful way. Did you guys want to do challenging? Um, challenging was um, mm, I was attached to this project for a long time before any of these people here, um, and I believed in it so much and um, stuck with it. And sometimes it, it was really difficult to make and to get it going. And that's also the most rewarding thing about it. It's like you know we made it, so I'm very proud to be here, and we did it. Which is such an accomplishment. <laughs> yeah, um, Gemma brought Gemma brought me the script. Gemma brought me the project, and both Gemma and Elizabeth. Something that has been so such a nourishing experience for me as a filmmaker is their generosity and their support. And I think um, we talk a lot. Oh, when, when you think about what it's like being a director people presume that you're the one looking after everyone else all the time. And there's a bit of that. But um, these two ladies have looked after me and supported me. And without their faith in me and my vision and the project, um, it, we wouldn't be here. So I think this moment, you know, where all sorts of people are getting to make films, um, you know, people like Gemma and Elizabeth can lift people like me up and give them the chance to do that. So that's... And we need your voice. It's a beautiful one. <laughs> okay, another question? Yes. yes, could you speak about the locations where you shot? Mm -hmm. So it's a question about the locations and specifically Noel House, I would say, yeah. If you want well, to we made um, uh, a, a, the majority of the film in Ireland, in Dublin, um, which is an incredible place to make a film. Uh, Very cold. <laughs> it was, it was cold occasionally. And damp. It was damp occasionally. Um, uh, so we made it in and around Dublin, and we had tremendous support from the Irish Film Board in doing so. Um, and, uh, you know, when we... It really lent itself to... Uh, making the film in Dublin really lent itself to our expressionistic approach to the film visually, because we... Much of what you see... Is aren't it's not that that's not really Charleston. Sorry, it's <laughs> <laughs> all an illusion. Uh, it's not really you know it was never an option for us to shoot in the real real location. So we had this amazing freedom of travelling around Ireland and 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 I spent about six months um, hunting for locations. And we we didn't have even though I'm incredibly grateful for the investment in the film and our finances have been incredibly supportive. We didn't have the budget that a you know, huge studio film has. So our approach creatively was to go out into this beautiful country and find places, find houses, find castles that we could go in and, and kind of bring, sort of bring, bring our team to and, and adapt them and change them. And, and we met some incredible people, some really bonkers people. <laughs> but like mental people, just yes. lending us a castle. Like you can have it for the lending weekend. Lending us a it's castle. So yeah, so that was an amazing experience. And in terms of kind of Vita's story is, is very much about legacy and about the weight of legacy. And traveling around Ireland, meeting these in incredible families who live in these, rattling around these amazing old castles that they just happen to have inherited. The, the, but talking to those, the, the owners of those places was taught, informed me a lot of, in, in terms of bringing Vita to life and the kind of the weight of, of the responsibility of that, the legacy of that, had a kind of resonance with with um, with the film too, so so yeah. But we were lucky enough to shoot in Knoll itself, which if yes. you're not a Vita Sackville West fan, would, this is her ancestral home, and it's the sort of the the bill the the place that inspired Virginia Woolf, the the place that Orlando is set, and um, it, it was we were there for t one day only. <laughs> oh yeah. And we shot in the chapel where Virginia Vita really got married, yeah. and it was really special to. Finally, end in that legit place, even though we'd had. Well, it was kind of it. It became a very much part of the style that the only <laughs> the only place that is really, really, really real is the only place that Vita could never have. So, so you know, being at Noel was this sort of lovely kind of inverse 
provided this lovely kind of inverse kind of rudder to the whole visual style of the thing. But it was amazing to shoot at Noel Noel, as we called it. Because <laughs> um, it was just a, such a puzzle once we were editing. It was like, is that Noel Noel or not Noel? <laughs> cool. Um, uh, and then we shot this in London as well, which was lovely. I froze Elizabeth by the Thames on Valentine's Day. So, there we go. <laughs> okay, I think we have time for one more question. Yep, just on the balcony here. Yep. Um, so this is kind of the big Hi. one. This is kind of the big one question where um, Virginia's going to go away with Lisa and Carol says, you know, this can never really work out. And of course, she gets an opportunity because she wants me to be. She wants yeah, to nightmare. <laughs> I think it would be the same, because they, it's not about the social constraints why they don't work out, I don't think. It's that they, you know, Vita can't be within one person or by, you know, she just can't. And she never did until, you know, she was very old. She was always had many lovers. And, and, and their relationship just sort of, it just went, it's, it went where it went. And then, it, and, you know, they, it moved into something else. and. Even if they could, you know, get together and live together, I, I don't think they'd want that. Would you think they'd have wanted that? I think she might have liked the idea of it really? for a bit. But, you know, it's such an interesting question, really. And I, I, I actually think that scene is so interesting when he says, what do you really want to get out of this? You know, what? I actually feel like it's an incredibly pivotal line. And I don't... It's one you suggested. No, it's not. I remember it. You knew it was. Really? Yeah. <laughs> There you go. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> no memory. Um, but, you know, I think it's pivotal because... Oh, now I realise why I suggested it. Because it's a turning point for the character. Um, but... Um, <laughs> No, but it is. It's really important, I think, in life to have people who are sort of truth tellers and sort of at the, at the, they bring a reckoning. And I think that, you know, people who you love and trust can be those people for you. And I think that Leonard was for her. And she loved him very deeply, and so she listened. Um, and I think that when she did ask herself that question, I don't know that she really knew what she was going to get out of it. And it wasn't what she thought this is getting very ambiguous, which love is. But, you know, it, I don't think she realised... I think she realised in that moment that the thing she thought she could get from Vita was never going to be there. Oh, which brings me ni nicely on to... So, you know that bit where... <laughs> v Virginia's written Orlando and it's been, like, the biggest love letter of all time and she gets it printed and sends it to v Vita and Vita dedicates it to her new girlfriend as Orlando. That's based on fact because I was, given a book. <laughs> yes. be clear. But I was given a book, that, uh, like a book of a, a very, an original copy of Orlando, which Vita had signed to one of her lovers as like with Orlando's love. And I just thought that is harsh, <laughs> you know, but it's also that, that moment where, you know, Virginia realizes that she does the biggest thing she could possibly do for this woman. And, and she's still, you know, it's a moment of, oh yeah. I'll see you now. I see your true colours. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, that's what's going through her head. <laughs> We're grown ups, I promise. <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah. I, I I think it would. I think regardless of when the the film was set, it would have turned out the same. I, I think their relationship was their relationship, and they remained in each other's lives for the rest of Virginia's life. Uh, and again, uh, to sort of echo what, what Gemma said, um, <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to sing the song. <laughs> Are you not going to sing the song? Um, <laughs> I'm not going to sing the song. <laughs> no, I'm not doing it. Um, uh, I think, as, uh, to echo what Gemma said about, um, oh, God, I'm going to sing the song. I see your dream. No. Um, <laughs> Leonard and Virginia's marriage was one that had a tremendously progressive approach to her mental health, bringing it right back down to something serious now. Um, and I think that he offered, and they together, 
built a structure for her from within which she could write and live. And that scene where she says, I, I, I need Leonard and I love him and, and it's taken such a long time for me to find balance. Yeah. She couldn't be without him. Uh, they couldn't be without each other. And, and in a similar way, Vita and Harold as well had a tremendously had a tremendously supportive marriage and we wanted to make a film where no one said no to each other. And, and, and so I think there, wa there wasn't, Vita was never going to totally leave Harold and Bob's not, no. And v Virginia and Leonard would never leave each other. So I think that Vita and Virginia's relationship found the right shape. And I think that it's a film about an, an unconventional relationship which remained really potent and really passionate for the rest of their lives and defied definition, as so many relationships do. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's very true. OK, well, that was, I think, a really beautiful way to end this because it is about love. And uh, I think we love that you brought this film. And thank you all so thank much you. for coming. Thank you for joining us. And if you love the film, don't forget to vote for it for a People's Choice Award. Thank you.